grace, mercy, and peace unto you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for the 18th Sunday after Trinity is from the Old Testament reading. That is Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. I will read the text. The same night Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Puniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Puniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I preach the sermon, let me ask you a simple question. Do you like to eat beef tendon? Let me say, if you go to a Vietnamese restaurant, there are many poor noodle options. Some people like just beef tenderloin noodle or seafood noodle or some adventurous noodle. One of the adventurous noodle is poor with beef tendon. There are some people like me who love to eat beef tendon, but there are other people like my wife Young Sun who don't. For them, to eat tendon or not is just a matter of preference. However, for Orthodox Jewish people, it is not a matter of preference. It is a matter of breaking the law of God. The laws regarding the prohibition of displaced tendon are found in Jewish law, Mishina, chapter 7, which is based upon the story in Genesis chapter 32, that is today's sermon text. The Genesis text tells us the reason why the Orthodox Jewish people do not eat the sinew of the thigh. It just comes as the result of the strange wrestling at the ford of Jabbok by Jacob, one of the famous Jewish ancestors who had lived a panoramic roller coaster life. As the text says, after sending all his siblings and the livestock ahead of him, Jacob was all of a sudden left alone. Just at that critical moment, a very odd and strange thing happened. A man came to him and wrestled with him, not 10 or 20 minutes of fun game, it was not five or ten rounds of a wrestling game. It was far more than that. It was at least several hours of continuous fighting until the breaking of the day. 
because of the long duration of time, some people might think it was not a physical fight, but a spiritual one. However, the dislocation of Jacob's hip socket points to no more than an actual physical fighting. Now, at this moment, let me tell you something. Although the text seems to be all about wrestling, but the text gives us a very profound meaning and lesson. That is, who is the wrestler, by the way? Identity is very important in our text before us. Of course, we hear the text read. We made some immediate assumptions the same assumptions that are always made. Jacob is the wrestler, and the one with whom he wrestles, while a bit vague, appears to be God. Indeed, it is the pre-incarnate Son of God, Jesus. These are the wrestlers in our text. You have properly identified them. But if we stop there, we will end up on a path that leads to confusion and even false theology. What happens when we simply identify the wrestlers and then look for the way to make this Bible story speak to us? One move we make is to insert ourselves into the story. We take the role of Jacob. And we speak of wrestling with him in prayer in order to receive our blessing, the answer we desire. What that means is that we think this is all about us, and it is not. Another way we frequently understand this text is to interpret it as a battle cry. You will be assailed with the soldiers of Satan and the wicked of the world. Fight the good fight. Pour in all your efforts till bloodshed. Do not give up. And in the end, you will be blessed with great honor, power, and riches. Persevere people and prepare for the piles of plunder. This is also the wrong direction. I'm not saying that we are not in a battle, because we most certainly are. I'm not denying that the evil forces of sin, Satan, and our world are grabbing at our lives and pulling at our limbs in an ongoing attempt to pin our face to the mat. This is our reality, our condition, our heritage from our first parents. Evil prowls our streets and rules our institutions. Satan remains an active and dangerous foe who must be subdued, lest we die physically and eternally. Our world continues to shock us daily with its ability to conjure up even greater and more horrific examples of corruption. The evil one is here. The world surrounds us with its corruption. Sin is crouching, ready to take us down. We are in a battle, the most serious battle of all. We all know this, but still we are to ponder, who is the wrestler? Don't be surprised. Please be ready to hear. The wrestler is not Jacob, and the wrestler is not us. When Jacob receives his new name Israel, and when God explains his particular name, he identifies the wrestler. It is the same one who has wrestled from the beginning, the same one who wrestles with Jacob, the same one who wrestles with Satan on a cross and the same one who wrestles for us 
every day of our lives. The wrestler is Christ Jesus. Jacob's new name can mean you have wrestled with God, or it can mean God has wrestled for you. Hallelujah. God has wrestled for you. Regardless, this is what is said by God himself. You have wrestled with God and man, but now I will wrestle for you. Not with you. Not by your side. Not if you need a little extra help. Not, if, not when you are flat on your back. No. I will wrestle for you. Just as I have wrestled for you in the past. So I wrestle for you now. And I will continue to wrestle for you until the day you stand in the court of heaven before the throne. It is God who rescues the Israelites from the hand of Pharaoh with the parting of the waters, not man. It is God who drives out the Canaanite before Israel that they might possess the promised land, not man. It is God who takes the burden of our sin to the cross at Calvary and engages in a battle, not man. The Christ carries our sins to the cross. It is Jesus who suffers and sheds his holy blood on our behalf. It is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as he dies in our place. And though it looks as if he has been defeated as he hanged limb upon the tree, the greatest victory of all takes place in three days as the Son of God rises from the dead, having conquered sin, death, and Satan. It is God who is our wrestler. He is the one who fights in our place on our behalf. And he has claimed a great victory which he bestows upon us every day. God is the wrestler. God is our wrestler. This reality did not begin when Jacob was rolling in the dust by the foot of Jacob, Jephthah. It began as Adam and Eve were driven from the garden. This reality did not end when Jesus was victorious upon the cross and Satan was pinned and chained in defeat. It ends when we are safely through the gate of everlasting life. I do not have to tell you that the battle, the fight is ongoing. Satan has been conquered, but he has not quit. Every day, we are challenged by the desperate evil of our world. And we find ourselves in chokehold that threatens our faith. Fear not. There is the wrestler, the champion, the strong deliverer, the valiant one. As Luther sang in his hymn, a mighty fortress is our God, the Christ who daily fight for us. When, we made you, when he made you his own in baptism, your old Adam was killed and the new Adam rose up. But as Luther tells us, the old Adam is a good swimmer who must daily up, up, pop up every day. He must push back under those holy waters. Christ's strong arm does the pushing. Why that strong arm? If you will, try to win the battle by yourself. Rely upon your own reason and strength. Be your own wrestler. And when you have had your face rubbed in the dark, 
and the wind crumbled from your body. You will be grateful and thankful to know that the true wrestler, the true wrestler has got your back. Hallelujah. He fights for you. And nothing can stand against him. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We sing hymn number 656 of Lutheran service book, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. He helps us free from every need that has us now obtaken. The old evil now means deadly woe, deep God and great might, are desperate arms in fight. On us is not his equal. With might of ours cannot be done, Soon war our loss effected. But for us fight the valiant one, whom God himself elected. As he who is this, Jesus Christ it is, of Sabaoth's road, and there's none other God. He holds the foiled forever. Though evil still the world should feel, all eager to devour us. We tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overtower us. This world's this may be dear, so long as he will, he can harm us none. He's judged the deed is done. Our little word can fail him. The word they still shall let remain, nor are any thanks have for it. He's by our side upon the plain, with his good gifts and spirit and take day our life good fame child and wife though these all be gone our victory has been won the kingdom ours remains